early 1900s, very important port, mainly for fishing. And you probably noticed as you came off the tender, there's still a fish market here, and there are two or three fish restaurants in the buildings on the right. So when you come back at lunchtime, if you want traditional fish and chips, you've got it right there on the doorstep. There are three ports all in a row here. We're going to turn up to the left at this uh, next roundabout. If you look to the right, you'll see there are a number of modern apartments built on what was formerly Granton Dock. And then there is New Haven, and at the other side of it, there is the port of Leith. And these three towns were, until the early 1900s, separate towns in their own right. And it was only at the beginning of the 20th century that they became part of the city of Edinburgh. So the actual city of Edinburgh, the, the main part of it, is about five miles from here. And generally speaking, it's uphill. And in the past, the fishermen's wives used to bring the fish into Edinburgh. They had very tall, narrow wicker baskets with, with hooks to hook them over their shoulders. And they would walk the five miles up into Edinburgh to sell the fish. And it is uphill, so it wasn't easy. <clears throat> the last of these women retired in 1974 when she was 75 years of age. And she'd been doing that since her teens. So she must have been fit. <laughs> On the left, there's a small building that says New Haven Station. This is a former railway station. Because these were all very busy ports, there were railway lines that came to them. And they would bring goods, but also people who were going for trips on either across the river or further afield. These railway lines have been closed since the 1960s. On the right-hand side, you'll see some quite, quite grand houses that were built in the 1800s. And these bigger ones would have been for one family, this one here, for example, on the right, that would have been for one family, probably a ship owner, a merchant, possibly a senior ship. So you can see some of the kids are out on the playing fields. Uh, we'll be coming to another set of playing fields shortly, and they all belong to some of Edinburgh's private schools. The schools themselves are not here, um, but playing fields are stuck. That's a very good, clear view of the castle from here. You can see that the castle isn't just one building. Like most medieval castles, it's had several buildings built on over the years, and it's, it's actually a collection of buildings today. So go right along here until we come to Traffic Lights at East Ventus Avenue. We turn left there. And So this area here used to be known as Golden Acre because in the past it was all orchards and fields. And this is where a lot of the fruit and vegetables for Edinburgh were grown. So it became known as Golden Acre. As you can see, that's all gone now as Edinburgh began to grow. More and more houses were built and um, Golden Acre ceased to be, ceased to live up to its name. Scots Baronial. So it gives the buildings this kind of castle-like appearance. Now the, the bollards on the sides of the, the street are to create cycle lanes. Uh, this happened in 2020 and is now part of our register house. The architecture here is known as Georgian, after King George III, who was on the throne at the time. Georgian architecture is typically three stories high, a, a rather plain but quite elegant frontage to the houses. And we're just going to pause here outside Butte House, number six. This is the official residence of Scotland's First Minister. 
Now, forgive me, I would normally stand up at this point and face you, but recently coaches have been fined for stopping here. So I'm staying seated so that if we see a ward and we can make a quick getaway. <laughs> um, so apologies for that. But this is Butte House, official residence of Scotland's First Minister. That's the person who leads the Scottish Government. Um, not where he stays, but where they have meetings and events, press conferences and things like that. And occasionally it can be used for overnight stays. The Georgian architecture, three storeys high. Look at the stonework at street level. The stonework's been cut, the stones have been cut. You've, they've got beveled edges, it's quite decorative. And then above the windows, you've got the stones in this kind of fan shape above the windows. So that's that costs money. So this is showing that you know somebody was spending money in these houses. When you get to the bedroom levels, the stonework's plain. And the windows change too. They get smaller as you go up the levels. So up at the top, the windows are much smaller than they are lower down. Um, above the door, there's usually this half fan light window, semicircular window and that's to let more light into the hall. And then they have these um, cast iron railings and lamp standards. And at the bottom step, there's little boot scrapers because men were on horseback at the time. There were no paved roads. They were just hard packed mud with straw thrown onto them. And so the boot scrapers are on the bottom steps so they could clean their boots before going into their grand houses. Underneath is the basement level. You can see the stonework's very rough at that level. And this would be for the, the senior household staff. The lower household staff would have a rear entrance. They wouldn't be allowed in the front. And this square, Charlotte Square, is regarded as one of the finest examples of Georgian, Georgian architecture in the whole of the UK. It beats um, even some of the Georgian with the statue because it was unveiled after he died and she was so taken with it that she knighted the sculpture on Steele arrived and Sir John Steele went home to his wife for his lunch. Not a bad morning's work. The garden itself is this private. Is the um, there are no gardens in front of the houses in the new town, <coughs> but there, there were gardens provided for the use of the residents. They're the only folk who have keys and it remains a private garden today. So we're going to move on if we go left and then we'll go down to number nine, downstairs. Thank you. Now, as you can imagine, this first ends of the rectangle, and St Andrew's Square is at the other short end, and that's where we're going. One of the long ends along Queen Street. And we will end up at Charlotte Square at the other end of this first phase of the new town. <coughs> the man who designed it, um, James Craig, won a competition for the design of the town. And he was actually only 24 years of age at the time. So that was quite a feather in his cap. And it set him up for other commissions because he was then given commissions in Glasgow and other cities around the country. So this is one of the long sides of the rectangle. It was built with houses on one side of the street for most of its length and a garden on the other side. So this part, this house is on both sides, but for most of the rest of it, there's a garden on the left. And again, it was and remains a private garden. Only the homeowners or business owners have keys to it. And you can see that the, the ground floor level, street level, has been occupied by a number of businesses in many of these properties. The houses themselves will almost certainly have been converted into apartments. There are a few people who, who could afford a complete house in the new town. Um, so they've been divided into apartments in each level. For a small two-bedroom apartment, uh, you'll pay the best part of half a million pounds. And we're just going into the middle of the rectangle just now. There's a, a road called George Street that runs right through the middle, just on the brow of this hill. Go. 
And the first building I'm going to point out is the assembly rooms coming up on the right. You'll see orange banners with assembly rooms written on them. And this, in the past few years, it's currently the Intercontinental. I don't know how long that'll last. Uh, we've got a taxi parked on our left here. We've got a van that's parked a bit further forward on the right, so we can't move. This was previously a Kimpton Hotel. There is a hotel in Charlotte Square, um, the Roxborough, which is also a Kimpton Hotel. It's a Kimpton Charlotte now. Taxi's about to move, so we'll get away after that. Just after the hotel, there's a church, the Church of St. Andrews and St. George's on the left. And on the right, the building with the columns was a former bank headquarters, but is now a restaurant and nightclub complex. Now, this sorry, the coach is blocking your view. Yeah. With the church, and they've got a book sale just now. Oh, it's a very interesting church because it's oval in shape. Can anyone guess why? Come on, let's see if you're awake. <laughs> no oil guesses? It's so that there are no corners for the devil to hide in. So even in the um, 18th century when that church was built, people were still very, very superstitious. Even those who, who believed, they were still very superstitious. And that's why the, the church was built oval. Makes sense. So this is St Andrew's Square, the opposite end of the rectangle. And you'll see that houses, if you look at houses on the left, they have been added onto. They have these porches at the front that were not original. These have all been added on over the years. And in particular, the one coming up, look at the stonework, completely different to the original stonework. And the porch doesn't match it. And then this building at the corner is completely different. The Georgian building was knocked down and replaced. And that has happened to this part of the new town where some of the Georgian buildings have been changed or replaced. Coming up on the left is the only house in the new town that has a garden in front of it. It wasn't in the plans and the architect resisted moves to build the garden. So how come it's there? Well, in the centre of the square, there's a very tall column with a man in the top. He is Henry Dundas. So round here and then left. The politician in Scotland. He was the government's representative in Scotland, virtually ran the country. He was also head of the Royal Navy, so in two ways he was a very powerful man. And if you're the nephew of the most powerful man in Scotland and you want a garden, you're going to get your garden. And that wasn't the only way in which Henry Dundas was controversial. He's the only UK politician ever to have been impeached, and that was for alleged misuse of naval funds. So he lost his powerful positions. He was eventually cleared and he returned to Parliament, but in nothing like the positions he had had before. He's also controversial for introducing a delay to the Abolition of Slavery Act. This act was going through Parliament when Henry Dundas argued that you couldn't just go it. That was the thinking behind it. Now below the shops on the right hand side is Waverley Station, the main train station in Edinburgh. And on the other side of it is the Old Town. This is the other long street in the rectangle, Princess Street, and it effectively separates the new town on our left from the Old Town on our right. The building on the right with the flags outside is the Balmoral Hotel. For our Harry Potter fans, this is where the last novel was written. The first one was written in a tiny wee cafe, nursing a single cup of coffee for the whole morning. And the last one was written in the five-star Balmoral in a suite, no less. So change fortunes for J.K. Rowling. Straight, straight, aye, yeah. Building on the left is Register House, home to all our records, birth marriages, deaths, immigrations, and that's where a lot of people come to research ancestry. The statue outside it is the Duke of Wellington, celebrated all over Britain, 
because his victory at the Battle of Waterloo brought to an end 30 years of war between Britain and Napoleonic France. And Britain was about to go bankrupt if these wars had continued. So Wellington is celebrated all over the country. On the right behind the buses is Old Carlton Cemetery, home to the Abraham Lincoln Memorial. Now it's not a memorial to Lincoln, it's a big statue of him, but it's not a memorial to him. It was commissioned by him and it was to honour and thank the Scots who fought in the American Civil War. So that was a nice gesture on Lincoln's part. The building on the right, which is obviously undergoing some work just now, is the service. It's a much bigger building than it looks. Because it's built on a hill, the other side of it is seven storeys high. And the civil service are the people who do the work for the government. Now you've got a much closer view of Arthur's seat just now. Mm. If you look at the tallest part, you'll see the ruins of the Abbey. And keep looking left, we're coming back this way, and we'll deal with the right hand side when we come back. So keep looking left, because once we're around the next corner, you'll see the extension to Holyrood, which is going the, the direction we are travelling. And at this seat, the modern tower, the one that was built in the 1660s, and the old one at the other end of the building. And the Royal Standard is flying from the top of the building because the Royals are in residence. I can't see what that is. It's clearly not investigating a crime scene. They're looking a bit too casual for that. Um, it must be some kind of as the marathon route. We'll just come back past that one. Yep. This is a visitor attraction called Dynamic Earth, and it's all about the Earth's core, the forming of the Earth, and then there's a geological section where they talk about the forming of rocks and mountains, the drifting of continental plates, all that sort of thing. And there's another area where it looks at weather patterns, what causes thunder and lightning, what causes typhoons and cyclones and things like that. It's very, very popular with families with children because there's lots of interactive exhibits. Now, if anyone's got really good eyesight, so you've got binoculars or a zoom lens, you might be able to spot what the poster outside one of these tents says, and then we'll know what they're up to. But I don't think we're going to see. So another quick look at Holyrood for those of you on the right-hand side. I'm just stopping to let this bus turn. And then turn your attention to the left and we'll be looking at the Scottish Parliament building. So this is home to our Scottish Parliament. It was re-established in 1997. And they occupied um, temporary premises for five years until this was finished. You'll see there are some police officers outside and that's just because the royals are in the palace. There's always a police presence around. On the right, you have the Queen's Gallery. I don't know if they'll change the name now. I suspect they will keep it as Queen's Gallery. It's one of a number of such galleries throughout the United Kingdom uh -huh, sorry, that display the Royal Collection. The Royal Collection is all sorts of gifts, paintings, artifacts gifted to the Royals when they've visited other countries or dignitaries from other countries have come here. And that collection doesn't belong to the Royals, it belongs to the country, so it's on public display. As you can see, there are lots of school and college trips around just now. The months of May and June tend to be when this sort of thing happens. In schools in particular, the month of May is an examination month. And so to create more space for examination rooms and the seniors' piece to go in with their exams. On the right hand side is Canongate Kirk, really normal, ordinary, tiny little church. On the right hand side coming up now is the old toll booth of the town of Canongate. This is Canongate. And it was a separate town to Edinburgh right through the Middle Ages until about the 1800s and then it became part of the city of Edinburgh. And the toll booth 
the toll booth was effectively a town hall. It's where the merchants met, where the merchants would meet to make decisions about the town. Um, it's where apprentices would be tested to see if they could be admitted to the relevant guild, the guild of bakers or the guild of carpenters or whatever. Um, they had to go through an apprenticeship and then produce some practical work which was examined. And if they didn't pass that test, they were not allowed to call themselves a baker, a butcher, a candle maker or whatever. And it's also the place where they would hear um, accusations against possible criminals and then dispense justice. And most toll booths had jail cells in them so that these people could be held. So as I say, until about the 1800s, Canongate, this area, was a monument that are on Carlton Hill. We passed Old Carlton Cemetery earlier, and on the opposite side of the road is Carlton Hill. One of the monuments you'll see is a, a needle-shaped monument, and that's a monument to polarity, and they were knocked down and replaced. But if you go into some of these little closes, you can still find buildings from the 15 and 1600s. And they're not ruins that they have. And Tom Riddle. Yeah. 